Switching regulator compensation is a topic that I think seems more complicated than it really is. All you really need to know if your switching regulator or your linear regulator for that matter is stable is a fast load step on the output and to monitor the output voltage to see what it does in response to that load step. To show how this works I created this test board and let me just quickly go through what I'm going to cover and that way you can decide if you want to stick around or not. So I'm going to show how to tune the compensation on this test board by adjusting the RC values at the output of the air amplifier and then I'm going to look at the simulation in LT Spice to see how I can get very similar results in simulation as the real board and then next look at LT PowerCAD which will give us not only the transient response but it will also give us a body plot so we can not only talk about what happens in the time domain but we can also see what happens in the frequency domain before discussing the details of the transient response, let's just go over the schematic for the test board itself. At the top of the screen is the circuit, uh, the LTC 3646-1 circuit, which is, will be our device under test. I chose it because it has a number of external configuration options. I can set the light load mode, I can set the compensation externally, I can set the switching frequency. On the, on the left side of the screen you'll see two circuits in boxes. We're gonna, they're both transient test circuits. We're going to be using the one on the bottom. With, the, with this circuit, the one on the bottom, the LTC 6992-3 is used, well it is, a variable frequency, variable duty cycle, uh, pulse width generator. And so the way I'm using it is to generate a very low duty cycle pulse that will drive Q3 fully on and switch in R6, switch in a 10 ohm load, and in our case we have a 5 volt output, and so 5 volts into 10 ohms will result in a half amp step, and R8 is used to sense the current. I mean, really it senses the voltage across the sense resistor, but that gives us a representation of the current step. Under my picture, uh, under the video U7, that's a linear regulator circuit that we won't be using. The rest of the schematic, the U17, Q1, Q4 circuit, is a very simple electronic load where the output voltage is divided down based on that potentiometer R28 and the resistor R29 to present a voltage to the two op amps and they force the inverting input voltage to be the same as the non-inverting input voltage by driving Q1 and Q4 and so basically you know as you adjust that resistor R28 it adjusts the load current now that we've discussed the schematic for the test board, let's, let's go over what we would like to see for our transient response. And for that I've pulled up a document from Texas Instruments that shows the relationship between phase margin and ringing in the transient response. So most people will say uh, at least 45 degrees of phase margin is what you want to be considered stable. And if we look at the curves they show, the lower the phase margin the more ringing you have and if we go down if we go down the table you can see that for you know phase margins above say 54 degrees and above there is no ringing at all in the transient response and we can scroll down and sort of see what they're talking about you know this this single bump they're calling it is 45 degrees almost 46 and if you have these two bumps that's 40 degrees, almost 41. And you can see just gradually as you as the phase margin decreases, you you increase the number of bumps or the amount of ring that you have. And as long as as long as we keep the phase margin, as long as we avoid any ringing in the transient response, we're going to have a solid phase margin. Now that we know what we want to see in terms of the output voltage response to a transient let's look at our actual board. So here I have adjusted the compensation so that there is no compensation capacitor switched in. And so we can see that the output voltage is just completely unstable. I mean this, the parts just oscillating at 40 kilohertz or thereabouts. Now let's see what happens if I switch in the 47 picofarad capacitor and slowly increase R4. 
Well, as I increase R4, it only gets worse. So let's switch in the 100 picofarad capacitor. And in that case, you know, it doesn't do much better than the last one. So now I'll switch to 220 and then slowly increase R4. And you can see in this case, the ringing almost completely goes away and then it starts to get worse again. Now I'll switch in C17, let's switch in that 470 picofarad cap. And you can see here is the first situation where as we increase R4 from zero, that we can get a response with absolutely no ringing. And this is the approach I like. Uh, I like to start just completely unstable and just let it ring. Uh, but you could also start the other direction and start with a very you know, conservative cap, like maybe 10,000 picofarad, 0.01 microfarad, and then adjust the, the series resistor from there to maybe start with a very slow, very well damped response, and then come at it from the other angle. Now let's zoom in on that same transient response and talk more about what we're looking at. So one thing that's really critical is we've already said that our current the representation of the current step is shown here in this green trace, channel 2. And what you'll notice is it's very fast in comparison to the response of the voltage troop and recovery. And that's what you want. You don't want this current step to be, you know, really slow, ramping up very slowly so that it's not even done recovering till say you're, you know, off the right side of the screen. What you want is the response to be fast. And the second thing you want, of course, is the shape of this output voltage to be what we've discussed. And we would also like to see, to give us confidence, a number of switching cycles, that it takes a number of switching cycles for the output voltage to recover. And that's actually what you're seeing in these little, um, well, what's called output ripple, but in this almost looks like a sine wave, you know, in these little um, ramps up and down, up and down, up and down. This is just due to the on-off nature of the part. And it's, it's important to know that that's not an oscillation. This is just the result of, of, of using a switching regulator. If we were to have a response where this output voltage, channel 1, recovered in, say, you know, four or five switching cycles, we might not know for sure if it actually has this shape or not because it, you know, so much is lost in because the step, you know, the step size is so much of the transient response, you can't you can always be sure if you have the right shape or not. In that case, you might have to do, you know, use a network analyzer and use a Bode plot. But for the vast majority of cases, that isn't necessary. I guess it's also worthwhile to talk about what's actually happening here. So, when on the left side of our screen, of course, V out is AC coupled here. When, uh, if we look at the left side of the screen, you just see the part, you know, as a flat DC value. And then when the current, the load step comes in, the output voltage immediately drops. And this is because the output impedance of the switching regulator isn't zero. And so when there's this, this load step, there's, there's a drop in the output voltage. And then you can see at some point it reaches a bottom. And at this point, the part is recognized, you know, we have a problem, the output voltage is low. And so it does what it needs to, to increase the output voltage, you know, back to our original DC level. Now let's take our same compensation values, but change the light load mode from force continuous to burst mode. And in this case, you can see that we have the same shape for our transient response, but something else is going on. Because once the transient is over, the output voltage goes up, but then really slowly starts to decay. And if we zoom out, we can see how pronounced it really is. Okay, let me go back just a second. We can see that when the current steps from 500 milliamps back down to zero, the output voltage goes up and just really slowly decays. And that's because in burst mode, the part has no ability to sink current. And so the only thing that pulls down on the output are the feedback resistors and any sort of parasitic or any sort of leakage current that might be there. And so the output decays really slowly in burst mode. 
But what we can do, which you'll probably want to do if you want to do a transient response, you know, with the part in burst mode or maybe uh, maybe a pulse skipping mode for light load, is to actually increase the load current in order to check the response. And that's what you're, you'll see here is that it, is that I've just increased the load. And I'll increase that load just a little bit more, it's just a DC load, until the curve looks just like what we had before with our part operating in force continuous mode. Before going on to our LT SPICE simulation, let's just take a minute and look at how much drop we get in our output voltage in response to our half amp load step. So we have 50, 100, 150, maybe 160 millivolts. So now let's switch over to LT SPICE where I've already put together basically the same simulation. Input voltage is the same, compensation values are the same. Switching frequency I made the same, feedback resistors, inductors the same. Now one thing funny you might notice is that the output caps have strange values, 12.9 microfarads. You know, what's that? <laughs> Where do you get a 12.9 microfarad cap? And this is one of the really interesting things about your ceramic caps is that, let me pull it up. All right, if we go to the web page for this particular part and we look at the DC bias characteristic, we can see that at zero volts bias, the capacitance is 22 microfarads, which is what we'd expect. This is a 22 microfarad, 25 volt part. But if we go out to five volts, we only have about 13 microfarads of capacitance. And that's exactly what I put in our simulation. 12.9 microfarads, and then I have a second one also on the board. I've estimated at three microfarads. And so this is going to be really important if we want accurate an accurate representation of our transient response is to simulate our ceramic capacitors accurately. Okay, at this point we've we've looked at the transient response on the actual board, the transient response in LT SPICE, and now I want to look at the transient response also in LT PowerCAD because not only can we get the transient response, but we can get a Bode plot as well. So here I've chosen um, I really didn't look much at the input caps. They won't make much difference for us for this test. The compensation I made the same as our actual board. The switching frequency, feedback resistors, uh, inductor, and again I've accurately entered the actual capacitance values of the ceramic output caps. So then if we go over to the load comp and load transient tab, we can see that our half amp, sorry, our zero milliamp to 500 milliamp load step results in about 154 millivolts of droop which is really similar to what we had in both the LT SPICE file and the actual board. Now we also want to look, we can also look at the body plot as well. We can see we have a bandwidth of about 22 kilohertz and tons of phase margin almost 75 degrees. And if there was a problem in any of these categories we would get an orange um, or red you know warning cell letting us know what's going on if you hover over it it'll give you you know an indication of what's happening and the body plot is important as well so the transient response is good body plots important as well because you know what are you going to tell your boss are you going to tell him that in order to stabilize your switching regulator that you turned a knob and switched you know, switched in some capacitors till the shape was right, or do you, or do you want to tell him that you used type two compensation to establish a pole zero combination such that the loop bandwidth was pushed out past 20 kilohertz while maintaining tons of phase margin? And <laughs> clearly, you want to tell him the the second. And so, it's good to be able to not only talk in terms of time domain, but also in terms of frequency domain. One thing you may have already picked up on is that, you know, in this case, I'm using external compensation, and so, yeah, you adjust the compensation values to make sure that it's stable. But what do you do if the part is internally compensated? And one of the nice features about this part is that you can do that simply, well, at least in the model, you can simply do it by, you know, clicking a button. I think in the on the actual part, you have to tie the ITH pin to int VCC, uh, but all we have to do here is just click this button. And then, I mean, the interesting thing about internal compensation is that you don't obviously have to include these external components 
but on the downside, there's no magic to an internal compensation. So it's just going to pick values for you that it expects to be stable or that it knows will be stable over a, over a large range of capacitance values. So if you go into the load comp and load transient and you don't get what you want, then of course you can no longer change your compensation values, but you still do have some control. And that's what I want to show. If we adjust, well, let's go back to the schematic for a second. If we adjust this feed forward cap, the, the capacitor across the upper feedback resistor, or the capacitor across the lower feedback resistor, both optional capacitors, we can change the transient response. And of course, also if we change the number or type of, of output caps, that will also change the transient response. So those are sort of our, the knobs we can turn with an internally compensated part. And just to give a quick example, where are we now? We're at 54 degrees of phase margin. Let's just add a small 10 picofarad feed forward cap. And now we've boosted it up to almost 100. So, you know, that's something that you could do. Just something to be aware of if you have an internally compensated part. Not only should you be aware of internally compensated versus externally compensated parts, but you should also be aware of the difference in voltage mode and current mode parts. Now, the LTC 3646-1 is a current mode part. It's the one we've been using. And, you know, it's 2021, and for the past several years, and almost certainly, you know, looking forward, current mode control dominates parts. And so if you pick up a buck regulator, I would say, you know, there's a 95% chance or greater, 95 or a greater percent chance that you're picking up a current mode part. And there are a number of reasons for this. You know, current mode parts are easier to get to current share well if you parallel them. They're easier to compensate. They are, they inherently handle short circuits better. They inherently handle input line steps better. Now, it's not to say voltage mode parts can't overcome, you know, these, these, um, limitations, but it is to say that current mode is just inherently better for those things, and so you'll almost always see parts as and the parts as current mode parts. And so what I want to discuss briefly is just, you know, the three types of compensation that are kind of associated with, you know, type 2 and 3 are associated with current mode versus voltage mode. So the first I'll just mention briefly is type 1 compensation, and I'm looking at the LTC 3703 data sheet. It's a, a voltage mode buck regulator and it, it gives a good description of the three types. Type 1 is just a capacitor from the output either back to the feedback pin if you have an op amp or to the capacitor goes to ground if you have a transconductance amplifier. You almost never see this so I'm just going to move on. Type 2 is what we've been dealing with with our current mode control and so here are RC that we've been adjusting and this, of course, is an op amp. In our case, we're using a, the part has a transconductance amplifier so that RC and parallel C go from out to ground in our situation. And, you know, with type 3 compensation, this is almost always associated with voltage mode parts because with current mode, the output inductor doesn't show up in the small signal analysis. So with, with voltage mode, you have a little more work to do. So instead of the single RC, you have two RCs. And so hopefully if you're doing voltage mode part, um, you'll get some tool from the manufacturer to show you how to compensate it. But I've done, you know, I've done it the same way. I've done voltage mode parts the same way as we did our current mode part, just setting up two RC networks where they're shown here and just dialing them in until I get the shape that I want. I just want to mention a couple more things in terms of turning what we've did, talked about into reality with your board. You know, for this test, I put everything on a single circuit board. But of course, you could um, you could break out portions of this, this RC, to adjust the compensation or uh, the transient circuit that I've used onto its own board. And in fact, you know, I have one here that I use a lot and I just, you know, cut this circuit by hand. Uh, really simple to do, just a few components. And so you don't really need all this complexity, of course, for your own test. You just need bits and pieces. And, you know, if you don't have the RC, you can manually solder, you know, components on. But it's really nice, you know, I think at least at least in the beginning, you know, to do what we did, which is to, to physically dial in those values to get a feel for, well, you know, can I use a, you know, if a, if a part specifies a 51 kilo ohm resistor, am I okay with a 45 kilo ohm resistor? Or just, just to get a feel for how off you can be 
from the exact values, how far you can turn those knobs in one direction or the other before you start to see ringing. I think it's a really, you know, a really valuable experience. With that said, I think that's that's all I have. If I missed anything important, uh, please put that down in the comments. You know, I'm I'm sitting here talking to my <laughs> talking to myself in my office, so it's, it sounds good in my head. But you know, who knows by the time it gets recorded and you hear it. So thanks for listening.